Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this Friday morning devotional session. I'm Mike. Uh, it's a crisp and sunny day out there out of my window. So welcome to Friday. Um, today's passage is Hebrews 8, verse 1 to 6, which I will share with you now. Yes, here it is. It is this one. Let's go to the top. Um, and it reads like this. Here is the main point. We have a high priest who sat down in the place of honour beside the throne of the majestic God in heaven. There he ministers in the heavenly tab tabernacle, the true place of worship that was built by the Lord and not by human hands. And since every priest is required to offer gifts and sacrifices, our high priest must make an offering too. If he were here on earth, he would not even be a priest since there are there already are priests who offer the gifts required by the law. They serve in a system of worship that is only a copy, a shadow of the real one in heaven. For when Moses was getting ready to build the tabernacle, God gave him this warning. Be sure that you make everything according to the pattern I've shown you here on the mountain. But now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood, for he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises. So, um, what I wanted to do this morning was do what we've been doing these past two or three sessions and that is to focus on the old and the new and specifically how much better the new is than the old we hear about a far better covenant with god so what we essentially have is an old and a new covenant which we've heard a lot about these past few sessions and quite rightly so so what is a covenant is described as agreement usually formal between two or more persons to do or not to do something specified, a solemn agreement between the members of the church to act together in harmony with the precepts of the gospel. So that's the definition of a covenant. In this case, the covenant that is updated was that existing in the years before Jesus. In those days, communion with God and the gap between God and man was, was much more difficult to bridge. It required sacrifices in order to atone for sins, so as to be pure before God. The new covenant removed these additional steps as Jesus himself became the ultimate sacrifice before God, thus opening the way for us to be in harmony with God. And as Mark observed on Wednesday, the law could not make us perfect. We need Jesus for that, so that our relationship with God can be restored. Now, this was foretold in Jeremiah, um, which I'm going to share with you now. I've shared, um, where's my Jeremiah gone? Here he is. Um, the day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. The covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, though I love them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. But this is a new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And they will not need to teach their neighbours, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, you should know the Lord for everyone from the least to the greatest, will know me already, says the Lord, and I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. So there we are, foretold by Jeremiah, and also foretold in other areas of the Old Testament. And again, referring to Mark, that's not the book of Mark, it's our very own Mark Addison. The law is an indication of what God's standard is, but Jesus allows a way through. 
So we've heard what the new covenant achieves from this and previous devotionals. My take on this today is to bring some modern illustrations. So illustration number one. On April the 8th, 2017, BBC News reported that Judge Durham Hall QC was disciplined for not demonstrating impartiality in a case he presided over a year earlier. The case involved a woman convicted of a stabbing. The girl in question, who had been initially charged with attempted murder, pleaded guilty in 2016 to wounding with intent to cause grievous bodily harm. She had stabbed Mr. Zahula Buta in the stomach. Some years earlier in 2010, he had been served with a community order after he was convicted of abusing the same girl. In sentencing the girl, Judge Durham Hall said he believed Buta had been dealt with somewhat leniently. It is self-evident, he said, that this offence was caused by and solely relates to the impact of the offending upon you when you were a young girl back in 2010. He went on to say, I hope I will be able to help you. There is no question of locking you up. That would be callous and cruel to the extreme. The court heard the girl who had handed herself into police had told officers her life had been destroyed by the abuse she had suffered. She said she felt let down by the justice system when Buta did not go to prison. In sanctioning the judge, the Judicial Conduct Investigations Office said, said the said the Lord Chancellor and the Lord Chief Justice had considered Judge Durham Hall's comments made during sentencing at Bradford Crown Court and issued him with, in inverted commas, formal advice. A spokesman for the Judicial Conduct Office stated, said that Judge Durham Hall had stated that he would pay the victim's surcharge himself if the defendant were forced to pay. So there we are. So what do you make of that? Is that true justice or not? The law requires a conviction, but mercy requires that the victim in this case does not pay the price. Now, at the risk of being banned permanently from these sessions altogether, I move into very, very controversial territory and mention the name of Piers Morgan. Please stay with me, don't leave. As you all probably aware, Piers Morgan is a colourful, contra controversial media personality and a divisive one. However, last April, he took up the cases of various NHS workers being charged for parking their cars whilst working round the clock during the then COVID emergencies. Some were being fined for outstaying their permitted parking times due to work in the overtime, saving lives. Piers said, send the fines to me I will pay them for you. Maybe a publicity stunt, but it did highlight what many saw as a gross injustice. And there we have two examples where mercy has trumped justice. The law was enacted, but mercy was shown. Maybe modern examples of the new covenant that we've read about these past few days in action. The new covenant itself skews in the other direction. It offers mercy to all even if they were rightly convicted by the law. Remember the criminal on the cross alongside Jesus who repented and Jesus saying to him, today you will be with me in paradise. Let us now consider our third example. And this is the life of Charles Coulson who died in 2012. Coulson was prominent in US politics in the 1970s as special advisor to the then president, Richard Nixon the 38th president. Coulson was known as Nixon's evil genius. In 1970, the president made him his political point man for imaginative dirty tricks. Coulson talked about trampling his grandmother's grave for the president to show that he was as mean as they come. The New York Times said of Coulson, Charles W. Coulson, who as a political saboteur for President, President Richard M. Nixon masterminded some of the dirty tricks that led to the president's downfall. This became known as the Watergate scandal and every gate suffix scandal since takes its name from the Watergate Convention Center and complex where it was all uncovered all those years ago. And that complex still exists today as an unassuming 
office complex by the Potomac River on the DC side of the bank in an area known as Foggy Bottom. Coulson went to prison for his offences and there he surrendered his life to Jesus. He emerged from prison to become an important evangelical leader saying he had been born again. Later on it states that as a changed man Mr Coulson re-entered the political arena. When he went to the White House to state his case for religious faith as a basis for foreign and domestic policies, he found himself at that time pushing on an open door. Coulson is an example of the new covenant in action. A convicted criminal is forgiven and embraced by God. He learned his lessons and changed. He took of the vital chance Jesus had offered him on the cross. And finally, why the new covenant, which Hebrews speaks so much about? The answer to this must surely be love. The love and mercy of God for his people knows no bounds. For God, there had to be a way of dealing with the limitations of the law so that the love and mercy could shine through. And this is this was indeed dealt with by Jesus on the cross once and for all. Everyone in the new covenant era gets a second chance and a way freely given by the Father. Life is unfair. The world is unfair. What happened to Jesus is unfair. But we are now living in the good of what Jesus achieved. And as Richard observed yesterday, we should not take this gift for granted. Our job is to do what Jesus did and to show love and forgiveness to those around us. Graham Kendrick, who you don't hear so much about these days, put that unconditional love into words with a song simply entitled Such Love. And it goes like this. Such love, pure as the whitest snow. Such love weeps for the shame I know. Such love paying the debt I owe. Oh Jesus, such love, such love stilling my restlessness, such love filling my emptiness, such love showing me holiness. And such love springs from eternity, such love streaming through history, such love fountain of life to me. Oh Jesus, such love. The new covenant is about the undying love of God for his people. The new covenant, as we have seen, is spoken of frequently in Hebrews and is mentioned in today's passage. And today's passage provides and still provides a new way forward. We only need to seize and embrace that opportunity freely given. John 13, 34, 35 says, a new command I give what to you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love one another. A love for one another is what sets us apart from everyone else. As today's Hebrews passage says, Jesus is our high priest. So how to sum this up? Well, Elaine, Elaine provided the answer last Good Friday when she shared this. And I'm going to share this with you now. I shall leave it on the screen for a few moments. And it is this. We are saved not by what we do, but by what Christ has done. It is finished. And with that, I shall finish there. And I thank you for listening.